There it is. Hello, this is Tiffany with the Speak Up and Inspire series. And tonight we are going to be talking to Miss Deborah Denise of Black Love Charlotte and Miss Tara Long. Miss Tara Long ran for a, a council seat. And so we are going to talk to her about some really um, important things that are going on in our community right now. Both of these ladies have been actively working for our neighbors and for our community even with the COVID-19 shutdowns, the safe at home restrictions that are going all on all across the nation. And so I'm really, really happy and very, very honored to have both of them on the Speak Up and Inspire series this evening. Before we do that, I just wanted to let you guys know that next week we are going to, I'm sorry, all this week, we are gonna be talking to business owners who have opportunities for people who are looking to make extra income. On Friday, we talked to Ms. T. Flood about Total Life Changer, and I became a life changer today, officially. We talked yeah. to her last Friday. Um, this Friday, we are going to be talking to, y'all know that my memory is not good, so I have to keep up with my calendar. So this Friday, we are going to be talking to Ms. Lucretia Thomas. She is gonna be sharing business opportunities that she has for us and we thought that it was very important for us to have these Friday business opportunities because there are a lot of people right now who are unemployed, have been laid off, or are working reduced hours and need extra income. But even if you are not one of those and you have been blessed to be able to work from home, then this is still opportunities that we are putting out there for you so that you can make extra income and maybe even full-time income. So we will be looking forward to having Miss Lucretia Thomas on with us this Friday at noon. So please stay tuned for that opportunity. She is in the business of financial literacy and financial planning. So it's gonna be a very interesting topic, one that all of us need, no matter what your credit is, no matter where you are right now in life, financial planning is important for everyone. So please make sure that you tune in this Friday at noon with Lucretia Thomas. So hi ladies, how are you doing today? Hi. Hi there. I wanted to start off by talking to Miss Deborah Denise about what it is that you are doing in the community. I know that you are the founder of Black Love Charlotte. So please tell us in detail what Black Love Charlotte is. So Block Love Charlotte began literally on the block of North Tryon and 9th Street. We started out by um, opening our trunks. I was introduced to the block by um, Stacy Phillips. Um, she heard me speak at a city council meeting and she found out about all that I do to help the city's homeless as I've been doing it for years. And she was like, hey, we're, you know, she said, we come out every Sunday at 830 and we give out clothes, you know, that people have donated to us. And I was like, well, you know, I would love to partner with you guys. And I started coming out and I dubbed it the blog. I was like, you know what? We are literally on the blog helping others. Um, I started with stuff around my home and then we started including stuff in our grocery budget, me and my kids. And then mm -hmm. it just grew from there. Um, back then we probably helped out probably about 40 to maybe 50 homeless. Um, and then now as we fast forward and we're here in the midst of this pandemic, um, Block Love is servicing more than um, probably between 220 to 240, um, just in the uptown area. And then we also make deliveries, which is why I'm in my vehicle, because once I get off this interview, I'll be making um, additional deliveries. So we okay. deliver to about 40 or 60 more. Um, but Block Love is that hand that we all once needed when there was a need. Like when you needed somebody to be there for you, you always just wanted someone to not look at you, to not judge you but it just lend that hand. And so we're that hand in the community. We also want to change the narrative of what homelessness looks like. Because I tell everyone, I've been homeless myself and I never want anyone to place a stigma on me for being homeless. So we always want to change that narrative. And Block Love is about family. It's about spreading love throughout the city one block at a time. Right, right. Yeah, I, um, I had a moment in my life, um, probably about 
five years ago where um, I was homeless and it was really hard. I had to have the, the twins would stay with some friends of mine and I just kind of went from friend to friend, a couple of nights I slept in my car. Um, it was just not, it was not a good moment for me, but I was definitely able to reach out once I let my pride go <laughs> and open up to talking about it, um, which didn't take long because living in your car is not safe for a female and for anybody, but definitely not a woman. Um, so once I did open up, I did get the help, but um, it, it would have been nice to know of more services then than I do now, because not then I knew, but knowing the services that I know now in tongue tied um, would have been so helpful, especially block love. So I know that you you go to the block. Tell us what your your day your day to day activity is for block love. So at block love, normally we would um, our main day used to be Sundays. We would meet at the block at eight thirty a.m. We start with breakfast, and then we would give out toiletries. From there, we would um, then distribute a whole lot of donations. Um, and then on um, once the temperature got colder, we started doing Tuesdays. Now, Tuesdays are a little bit different because we call those Super Tuesdays because we serve as the Nevin community as well as um, the North Lake area. Um, we okay. do a little bit over off of Brookshire Boulevard. Now, okay. since the pandemic, we are feeding Monday through Friday. Um, at 5.30, we set up at 6, we serve. On Saturday, we're doing meals three times a day. That's breakfast at 9, lunch at 1 o'clock, and dinner at 6. And then Sundays, we do dinner at 6. Um, so that's pretty much what our days consist of. Wow. So is this your full-time job? Are you working another job? Because I can't you see got jokes, you girl. You got <laughs> jokes. So. I can't see how you're doing another job. So is this your full-time job? <laughs> is this what you're doing? <laughs> No, so I work full time in IT for a law firm from home. Um, yes. So for okay. seven thirty to four thirty, that is my full time job. That's what pays the bills and keeps insurance. Um, but there's such a need in this city and our focal point is not just the homeless. We also look out for the homeless. There are zero resources for single fathers that have found themselves homeless with children. And believe me, they are out there. Yeah. So we are trying to increase awareness to that because there's a great need here. And being a domestic violence survivor, I'm also, um, I advocate for these ladies that are out here on the street that are had to flee from domestic violence. And when resources aren't available, they may find themselves sleeping in their car, their van, or they may say, hey, I wasn't able to get into the, the um, shelter for battered women because, you know, the, in, there is an increase, especially during this pandemic. So I do connect them to Safe Alliance and other resources as well. Um, and unfortunately, I've had to do a lot of that. Um, yeah. So I'm also a domestic violence advocate as well um, through a number of avenues. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all over the place not not um, no i'm not like a superhero and you know that that uh <laughs> save hero. the world syndrome no it's just that's where i'm being used right now in this season you know it's nothing wrong with being a superwoman i think all of us have it in us um with me working full-time and then being a mom full-time i'm going to school um i also you know i'm also running butterfly visions project and you you made a very true statement domestic violence is on the rise with people stuck in the house together um, and domestic violence is definitely on a rise. So we're seeing, of course, more calls. Um, and a lot of times we were providing emergency shelter through a grant. That grant ran out in two weeks. Um, so that is how much the need is there to provide emergency shelter for um, women or men who are leaving domestic violence relationships. But we've had to refer women now and then when we're referring them we're getting them further and further out because the Charlotte resources the Mecklenburg resources are so thin um, that it makes it impossible to place anyone really right now unless you get in on a prayer and get them in somewhere local um, it's been really hard to get women in shelters or even transitional houses because they're all full right now um, so that is definitely, definitely a need for more support. We need it. Um, it's, it's been very trying. It's been very, um, how can I say, heart-wrenching for me to have to say, I'm sorry, I don't have anywhere local. We don't have any more funds. I can't get you in a hotel because all the hotels are closed. So they're forced to either go back to their abuser 
or to go to family, which a lot have been so isolated from their families in these relationships that they really don't want to. And then where do they end up? They end up in their cars or somewhere where they don't wanna go, which is really sad. So um, I know that you were saying that you're doing Monday through Friday in the evening, and then you have your weekend hours, and then you're doing deliveries. Are you delivering to families in need or where are you delivering to when you're not on the block? Who is, who are you, who's that population that you're delivering to? Families in need. Um, right before all of this started, we had a couple of individuals that transitioned into housing mm -hmm. um, that were formerly homeless. But the problem is now that a lot of the resources aren't available, their cases are on hold. Mm -hmm. So like I have one individual, like she's in her place with zero furniture. She got a bed yesterday. She was so excited to show me her bed because <laughs> yeah. um, she said somebody bought a new bed with their stimulus check and gave them her old one, their old one. So she was happy. But like right now, she's waiting for food stamps. So I'm delivering to her. Um, I've, I've delivered to a couple of patients, you know, where I have to ring they, their cancer patients. So I've had to ring their doorbell and just let them know the food is there on the doorstep for them. I mean, the need is so great out here. And we partner with other organizations. Um, but the need is just great. I, I read an article from... Um, spectrum news and they were talking about how many homeless it's over 3,600 homeless and I'm like yeah. we're barely scratching the surface I mean yeah. you know you got to think about the ones in the hotels and motels those are the ones that one time eat with Charles Robinson are feeding mm -hmm. um, I, I, Project Bolt they've got their own um, that they're feeding and then you know you look at us and we're feeding and then we partner today an awesome partnership with Dilworth Soup Kitchen and it's just like but still look at the numbers and it's a lot of hard work. Yeah, it is. You also made a really good point that you're helping men who are homeless with children. Um, I know that there is a group that is new who are trying to feed the homeless and they're, they are focusing on men because we know that women, we get a lot of resources because we're women with children, but the men, they don't have as many resources and they don't have as many um, uh, services that they can call in that we, we are pretty much pre-qualified for. They have to go through so many hoops for them to get the same services. So um, you might, I would love to connect you with them. It's Makisha and Daniel. They're a couple who just started um, their organization. They're trying to start an organization to help, yeah. especially who are homeless, who have families. So I definitely want to connect you with them if you're not already connected. Good. Good. Yes. So tell us how, what are your needs right now? Because I want to, yeah, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm, we're meeting with you probably probably every Monday evening, I'm gonna ask you if you can kind of come in and let us know what your needs are. So tell us, what are your needs right now? So our biggest needs right now are, um, we have washcloths, we can always use more washcloths. Okay. Um, and those go into the hygiene bags that we pass out on Sunday. So we always need washcloths. Okay. Um, another need we have right now is for, um, it's, it's getting there. So we would like to go ahead and stock up in that sunscreen. Um, okay. and bug repellent and bug repellent um because those mosquitoes are going to come as the rain comes they're going to need that bug repellent we put out um ant and insect repellent which will um uh help our around the tents and then we also put okay. down um this type of stuff that will keep the the rodents away i'll just put it like right. that yeah. Um, yeah. but seriously we we try our best we raise the tents and put them on pallets um as best as we could also, another great need is also blankets. Like any blankets that no one is using, we can really, really use the blankets. Um, we can use towels um, is a really great need. Um, okay. And I always tell people, if there's something that you can't get to us, please donate to us financially. On our website, which is blocklovectlt.org, there is a donate now button that's done through PayPal. And then also we do have cash app. That is dollar sign block love clt there is a block love out there so make sure it's dollar sign block love clt um okay. and that goes straight to us um we always are out and able to get our our order online our items so 
any time that you just say, hey, I want to donate, like we're doing Taco Tuesday. So we have some people make online donations. We have some people that are going to meet us on the block um, with the donations that we need to make Taco Tuesday success on the block tomorrow night. Okay. Um, another need that we have is underwear. We have a huge need for underwear. Um, we have a lot, I'm sorry, someone just called. We have a great need for underwear. We have um, a lot of our larger ladies need underwear like ASAP. Um, okay. And so some of the larger sizes are really a need that includes um, um, bras as well. And then for the guys, we need underwear, 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 underwear. I'm just gonna say it as many times. Okay. And, um, we need underwear ASAP so if we could get our hands on underwear that would be great okay um and if you, if you see me looking down I'm not ignoring you I'm, I'm typing this in <laughs> oh no 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 you are just fine <laughs> okay those, those so. right now um are our greatest needs we're always needing pop top canned food the reason okay. being is let's say there's a reason we can't make it to the street mm -hmm. we always give out pop top canned foods and I do that because I don't want them to miss a meal um, right. Or you have some that work, and so for their lunch break, they'll have something that they can pop, whether it's Vienna sausage, Chef Boyardee, okay. um, potted meat, sardines. We try to always have those on hand as well. Okay. All right. So I have washcloths, towels, bug repellent, blankets, underwear, especially larger sizes, and the pot top canned foods. Yes. Okay. Got it. Canned soup. Okay. And tell me your website again for donations. Our, sure. Our website is blocklovesclt.org. That's okay. blocklovesclt.org. You can mm -hmm. also email us at team, T-E-A-M, at blocklovesclt.org. Um, and then, you know, there's a form you can fill out um, on the website if you have any questions, if you want to know how to volunteer, um, or if you know of any location where homeless are, please let us know of that block as we would dub it. And we will try to assist those. We've had a couple of people that have identified areas. And so that's why we increase um, those that we deliver to in the evening because we do deliver to camps. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Got it. All right. So this is what um, I would like to do. And I know I'm throwing this at you, but every Monday at eight, I would love to have you on if you're available to come and tell us your needs. Um, I know that right now I'm currently looking on doing a uh, virtual book fair that the proceeds are going to be donated to Black Love Charlotte. That's something that I'm working on right now with your permission. So I have right now 13 authors who said yes to helping and doing this. Um, so we are working on a date now. Um, I am very, very um, um, I, I wanna make sure that you are getting what you need because there's so many out here who are needing your services. Um, I know we also have partnered with uh, hashtag lunch bag Charlotte. I'm sure you've heard of them. Um, and we've gone with them on Saturdays to help out. I just think that this is a need that needs to get as much support as possible. So if you're available on Mondays at eight, I'm gonna try to get you in here so that we can get about 15, 20 minutes with you to talk about what your needs are and find out what you're doing and where you are. So what do you have coming up um, on the weekends? So um, on the weekends, um, as far as need wise. Well, I know you said you are out in the evenings. I know the evenings might be hard for some people. So can some people help with you volunteering on, on the weekends? Are there opportunities? Oh, yes. So, um, and something I need to say before I forget. I have an amazing team. So I mean, yeah. I have team. <laughs> okay, I don't do this all by myself. I have an amazing Block Love Charlotte team. So I just want to give a big shout out. I'm not going to name them off because I'm going to forget somebody. Um, so Saturdays, we do breakfast at 9 o'clock a.m. Okay. Um, and right now we have a team that um, is providing that um, breakfast out of Cornelius. Okay. Um, so that's really, really awesome. Um, but we can always use fresh fruit um, anytime anyone wants to pull up and either drop off um, fresh fruit. But that goes pretty smooth because at 9 o'clock a.m., nobody's up but Jesus. Um, <laughs> so, um, but we do like to have a few hands out there. Um, what gets tricky is our lunchtime on Saturday. So 1 o'clock, um, we would love to have um, volunteers out. I just do ask that they show up in full masks and gloves. Um, okay. Uh, we do provide gloves, so at least if they have their mask, um, we have some extras, but, you know, 
we're in this for the long haul. So okay. we're going to make a show with masks. That will help. And then dinner is six o'clock on um, Saturdays. Now, Saturdays, if anyone is willing to donate, we try to do pizzas on Saturday evenings because it goes pretty quick. Yeah. Um, and that way the team can go ahead and distribute pizzas. And then we can kind of get rest up for Sundays. The Sundays are the long days. Um, Sundays we start at 8 30 a.m. and the hands that we really need are the donations because people pull up to the block with clothing so once we finish serving breakfast and hygiene bags it is like a, a, a literal mall like I mean <laughs> they can shop I mean from sneakers okay. to housewares to whatever they pretty much need um, That's great. whatever they can fit in their tents we try to provide so we can always use hands and that's at 8 30 and then dinner is at six o'clock we try to have them a nice sunday meal like if they were sitting at my table i tell them i can't fit you all around my table but i do my best <laughs> to provide a really good meal for sundays thank you that is amazing that is amazing and then you said something about taco tuesdays is that every tuesday or this is just a special tuesday tomorrow no 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 so i did before all of this happened mm -hmm. um the the week before all this happened i did taco tuesday and it was like so amazing i was like oh my god because me and my kids had taco tuesday yeah. <laughs> i was like okay so we had taco tuesday on the block and they were like oh this food is like so good so i said i gotta do it again so there okay. was a special request for taco tuesday and i was like why not pandemic or not yes. tacos are good any day yes yes Tacos are good any day, and we love Taco Tuesdays here in our household, too. It's very easy to cook, very easy to clean up. <laughs> that part, right. <laughs> okay, that is amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on with us, and hopefully you'll be able to join us the next couple of weeks on Mondays at 8 to let us know what's going on and what your needs are. So it is out there in the universe. We will also, I'll also put it out there myself as well. Um, so we have your needs. Um, we are here to support you. Thank you for joining us. You're free to stay on if you want with, with uh, Tara. Um, but if not, then thank you for your time. And we appreciate you for all that you're doing as well as your team, as well as your team. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Tiffany. And thank you. Tara does a lot. So thank you, Tara. Yeah. Oh, you're all right. I'm making you. deliveries. I'll talk to you ladies later. OK, thank you. Um, sorry, I'm about to say thank you, Tara. Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> no, Miss Tara, what's going on with you today? <laughs> How are you feeling today, Tara? I'm feeling great. I mean, I have a lot of energy. Um, as we were talking before we went on the air, um, you know, for me, it's the marathon cleaning spree around my house. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could get to cleaning, but I don't get to cleaning. <laughs> I think there are 20 some lights and fans that got washed in two days. Okay. <laughs> Nice, nice. Okay, so Miss Tara, I know that you do a lot in the community. So I'm just going to let you share what you want to share. What is it that you would like to share with us tonight about what Miss Tara is doing in the community? Well, first, here's my daughter, and she's giving Hi. me a uh, let's Say hello, we're on Hi, TV. Hello. <laughs> Hi, beautiful. <laughs> and I have my little dog on my lap so she snores that's what's going on <laughs> i have one too he's right here say hi dog. <laughs> okay so i mean we can start with um so you mentioned that i ran for office yes ma'am so let's start there um, a lot of people, there are some experts on the board of county commissioners and people like advocates that know what the county commissioners do, okay. but I can break that down so that people know what the, I ran for the board of county commissioners at large, which okay. is all Mecklenburg County. Uh, mm -hmm. Mecklenburg County has about 1.2 million people and that, that covers the towns as well. So, um, like Mount, um, uh, uh, Matthews, Cornelius. Mm -hmm. Davidson. Now, the Board of County Commissioners is, I think, the best, one of the best boards because they do most of the humanitarian money. So they have a $1.9 billion budget mm -hmm. that comes in through our tax revenue that they allocate to basically humanitarian services. Um, okay. The, um, the, stratification of it is education's number one mm -hmm. um health and human services is number two and 
Number three is actually debt servicing. So that's actually interest. And okay. number four is jails. Um, but they fund a lot of really neat programs like Habitat for Humanity. Mm -hmm. And um, anybody can apply for this. Um, it is um, it is a competitive way to get money, but I would certainly um, encourage anybody to apply, especially in the nonprofits. Okay. Um, one of the nonprofits that um, I serve on the board for um, Charlotte Area Fund. Yeah. And Charlotte Area Fund has been a great resource for people who uh, need a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So they give like job training or, you know, Charlotte Area Fund doesn't, but it helps, they help fund programs right. that give job trainings. They do a lot of things. They do like immigration. Uh, so if you're, if you're maybe your DACA expired and you need help with immigration, mm -hmm. they can able to um, to get uh, their status changed. Um, so that's why I love that board because, okay. I, and I ran on the platform oddly enough, Health and Human Services, which okay. is helping us right now. Yeah, yeah. We have to expand Health and Human Services. And right now, I mean, I ran on it because um, my entire adult life, I have worked, um, I've been a volunteer, a full-time volunteer, pretty much. Um, I've been very fortunate that my husband has been able to provide income. So I've never worked. I've just volunteered. I helped her 29 kids in the foster care system. If you are familiar with the foster care system, you get $15 a day. Mm -hmm. So by the time... Um, you buy your kid a book at the bookstore, that's $12. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Choose a book from the bookstore or a, a, a meal at um, Chick-fil-A. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the volunteer base at $15 a day, you're keeping them 24 hours a day. Of, right. Some of them went to school, some, did, some didn't, um, but it ended up being a, um, like 60 cents an hour. That yeah. these kids got. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to expand that program, Health and Human Services, the foster care, the health care. Um, mm -hmm. um, I, two years ago, ended up getting sick and I didn't know what it was. And I went to an ER doctor and the ER doctor um, said, well, it could be nothing. You could be just fine. Um, or you here, you might have a disease that could kill you in six months. And well, I'm not going to provide you with the antibiotic because I don't think you're going to be okay. <laughs> but you uh -huh. need to, <laughs> yeah. I had a hard time processing that. But that would, um, that would be hard to process. <laughs> yeah. So I left the ER and I got myself into the Cancer Institute. I do not have cancer, um, okay. but um, I have an autoimmune disorder. It's called IgG4 systematic, probable IgG4 systematic disorder. And um, um, it, it, it causes what I call pseudotumors. Okay, that's not the technical word for it. It looks like a tumor, it acts like a tumor, but it's not a tumor. And I can take um, immunosuppressants and they go away. Okay. Um, so, so it took me 10 doctors um, it took me through um, the healthcare system. So I got sick in November and then November, like 2017, mm -hmm. I maxed out my $7,000 deductible. Mm. In January, it started over. So mm. by January 30th, I had maxed out another $7,000 deductible. So in t almost two months, three months, I paid $14,000 to stay alive, to stay alive. Um, I got wow. to a point where I went to Duke Cancer Institute and this was at the end of the, um, at the, the, the deductible, okay? Mm -hmm. They said, you need to have an MRI. I said, great, okay, I'll have an MRI. They said, 
Well, in order for you to have it, you have to finish paying the rest of your deductible, whatever it is you owe cash up front. I said, okay. So 24 <laughs> hours before my MRI, which most people know is a life-saving uh, service, mm -hmm. they required me to pay $2,500 cash up front. And they gave me 24 hours to come up with that. Now, <sighs> you heard me say that it cost, um, it cost, Fourteen thousand, right? right. <laughs> and mm -hmm. you know, luckily, um, I didn't have cancer. You know, um, but if I had that rare cancer, time is of the essence. You know, the six months. You right. know, so pathetic. Um, when I got to the when I got to the cancer institute, I looked around the room and I just lost it. I just started crying, like tears were pouring down my face. Mm -hmm. I said, God. If you let me live, I will fight this. Mm -hmm. And so in 2018, in January, he let me live. And every single day afterwards, I have dedicated to fighting this healthcare system because healthcare is a human right. Mm -hmm. It is not a privilege. And I know that there were people that didn't get the treatment because they didn't have enough money and that's it. Yeah. And now whole pandemic, I mean, good people lost their job mm -hmm. the virus and it had nothing to do with their ability to complete the work. Mm -hmm. They were good people and they don't have insurance. Yeah. So in 2000 and well, I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit uh, more. Somehow during that process, Bernie Sanders started having this Medicare for all thing trickle into my, my feed. And I was like, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Everybody should have health care. Yeah. And then I started learning a little bit more and it was like, whoa, all the other industrialized countries have insurance like this already. Mm -hmm. Canada, everybody has insurance. Yeah. Germany, everybody has insurance. The Netherlands, we're the only country that doesn't give our citizens insurance as a human right. That's true. That's very true. So I thought about it and I was like, well, why, why don't we? Um, and along the way, um, I joined a team called Healthcare Justice NC. Okay. And um, Do Dr. Jessica Sachs, she founded this. 10 years, probably 12 years, because I've been in this group for two years, mm -hmm. but founded this as a physician. She was a physician at Biddle and mm -hmm. she wasn't able to treat her patients. She was mad. <laughs> she said, these people aren't getting care because they can't afford it. And the problem is not that she can't give them care. The problem is that insurance companies are denying them or mm. making it so that they can't have the care because their main profit, their main motive is profit. They yeah. want profit. And if they yeah. don't bust the medicine, then they're profiting. Every time you go to the doctor, mm -hmm. the insurance company is profiting. Yeah. So Medicare for all is a single payer system, meaning there are no insurance companies. It goes in and is paid out through the government. Um, we have, um, um, it, it's very similar to Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So it would just be, everybody uses the same system. Um, when you start having, um, the, the options, then what happens is the rich people go to the rich hospitals and the poor people go to the poor, poor hospitals. And we want everybody to have access to the same hospitals, the same treatments. And you do mm -hmm. that single payer system. Okay. Um, so, so healthcare justice NC, and I'll tag at the bottom. I'll tag the website. It's okay. free to remember. Um, basically, it is. Um, you just put in your email, and you get the doctor's um, emails and and the events that we're going to do. Um, and. It does state that you support Medicare for all. So it's like you'll sign a resolution. Okay. Um, but 
basically what I have here, and I don't, let's see if I can show you. Okay, here's the graph. And the graph, this is what Americans are spending and compared to other countries. So this is the US right here. So wow. we are spending way too much money on healthcare. And we're not yeah. getting the healthcare that other countries are getting. So by getting rid of insurance companies, and that's it. Like we don't want to, we, we want doctors to get paid. Um, we want you to be able to have your stuff. We just don't want to pay the insurance for the right to deny coverage. Okay, one of the things is, if you can see, um, we only go to the doctor four times in our current system. Like the average American mm -hmm. goes to the doctor four times. In Japan, they go 12 times. So they have more coverage. They have the freedom to go to the like right now, I mean, part of it is that we don't have the testing supplies for the pandemic, but ideally everybody who wants to get tested for COVID-19 should be able to get tested. And they're simply- That's very true. Okay. And part of the reason why they're denying it is because they don't have the resources to do that. They're making, they're, they're prioritizing it, which is fair based on resources. But right. with the care system, all of the people that lost their jobs and lost their insurance would not lose their insurance. They would still have insurance. They would be covered. And wow. what I campaign trail is healthy people are productive people. Yes. So like, it's great to deliver them food. They need, like when you're talking about the homeless population, it's great to deliver them food. But what if we could give them health care? And then them feel more productive and they want to go to work. You know, a lot of them probably have an illness that's untreated and they can feel better and be more productive just by getting health care. But right. because of the system that we have, we don't allow it. Right, right. Yeah, that, um, you know, I've dealt with, um, I have seen probably six or seven specialists myself. I've been dealing with chronic pain for going on six years now um, in my back and my legs to the point that I can't walk or I, I fall probably at least maybe once a month um, from weakness. Um, the pain is at a 20 and I've been going to doctors. They tested me for lupus, they tested me for MS, they tested me for sarcoidosis, they tested me for all these things and they still cannot, they tell me it's a bulging disc sitting on top of a nerve, but there's more to it. I get dizzy sometimes, I have weakness, I have this, I have that, that is beyond just a, a bulging disc. And so I definitely understand about going to the hospitals. They, they, I had Medicaid when all of this was going on because I couldn't work full time because I couldn't even stand. Even now, I can't stand or sit more than 20, 30 minutes without being uncomfortable because it's of the pain. Um, so I, it would, I was not able to go to physical therapy, which is what every doctor told me because yeah. Medicaid wouldn't approve it. Um, and then when they finally did, it was only for one session. What is that gonna do? <laughs> so I definitely, I definitely believe that the healthcare system is, is just a business. It's not about helping people. It's about making money. Um, and now with all of this, people have lost their jobs, they're getting laid off and they're being offered this insurance with like COBRA that is too expensive. How are they supposed to pay for that when they don't, don't even have a job? So now you have people not having health insurance and now we have the coronavirus. So now they're getting sick with the coronavirus and they can't get treated. So, I mean, it's just a rippling effect in this right here, having healthcare for all would solve a lot of these problems. And probably, we probably wouldn't be in the situation that we're in right now if people had the healthcare insurance to be able to go and take care of themselves before this happens. Because now those people are more susceptible to getting the coronavirus because of their immune systems and 
so forth. Absolutely. No, you were absolutely spot on. You were absolutely spot on. You know, um, the healthier the the healthier the person that catches coronavirus, the better survival. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people that haven't been getting a lot of care or not been taking care of themselves that are at high risk. Yep. Um, yep. And, and so you were spot on, spot on for that. Healthcare should be a human right. Everybody should have it. You should not worry about losing your house or, um, you know, they can't actually take away your house, but you know, some people like for me, we talked about, well, should we refinance the house to pay all these bills? Right. You know, who has $14,000 cash just to pay, you know, something, oh, what American has that? We don't. Right. Not the you everyday know? American like you and I. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so I became a healthcare advocate. Um, and in the absence of a Medicare for all system, expanding health and human services at the county level mm -hmm. is the best we can expand it. Right. Um, Last year, I spent a, um, a year as legislative advocate for Medicare for All through Healthcare Justice. Um, I stepped down from that position to run for office. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, my goal was to talk to all of the legislatures about, hey, we need this program. We need this right. program. And we really need this program now. In the middle right. of the pandemic. Yeah, we really do. Um, so if this is something uh, for the, the viewers online, if this is something that sounds interesting to you, please tell them that we need it. This is a legislative act an action. I mean, it is not current in our society. We need to bring it there. Right. Now, how, how does someone do that? How does someone say we need this? I mean, well, who do we say, who so, do we say that to? <laughs> yeah. I so, um, you know, the first action that I would do is I would sign the resolution for healthcare justice NC and connect with the physicians. So the physicians, again, they were mad at not being able to treat their patients and started this group. Right. Um, our group is for 3,000 members. It's free to join. And that just keeps you in the information loop. Um, okay. The second legislative initiatives, people that can bring us Medicare for all are people that are currently serving like Alma Adams, who does support um, healthcare as a human right. Um, Tom Tillis, who is currently running an ad on TV against Medicare for all, because he doesn't that healthcare is a human right. right. Um, and um, so talking to the congressman, Cal Cunningham is running against Tillis. So if he gets elected, then, then he will be the person in charge. Um, so making those connections, writing them, calling them. Um, also, another thing that we do is like, of course, I'm going to ask if you would, if you want a physician to come speak on your show, mm -hmm. I can have a physician and let them come speak. The physicians, the group as a whole, we mm -hmm. can go, you know, obviously <laughs> with COVID, we're not having events anymore. <laughs> right like group conversations and eventually COVID will go away and we'll be able to have group events and we'll speak right. and they can come in and educate um, church groups. So anytime you need a guest speaker, we can send a physician. Um, I can come speak. Um, um, so ordinarily we like to have pre COVID-19, mm -hmm. we like to have a group and then we have a panel. So, um, maybe two doctors, like if it was, a, if it was a church that we did it in, mm -hmm. maybe like doctors and um, some of the higher clergy. Okay. And then we have a group discussion and then they would talk about this as a program. And then they'd ask questions to the audience to see if they have any like questions and audience, you know, now with zoom meetings, it'd be just like you and I having this discussion, right. except for having it with a physician. So, right. um, now, our now, because, I mean, I feel, and I, I'm probably sure a lot of people that are listening will agree that we feel like insurance and, and healthcare system is just a big business. Um, so our physicians, our doctors, and if in this um, organization, the Healthcare Justice NC, and are they open and talking about this? Because I would think that 
they would be the minority as a physician to want this to, to happen. Okay, so I actually have a slide on that. Um, and most doctors now favor the single payer system. I'll hold this up to, to, to show everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so it says 56% of doctors support, Medic support Medicare for all. Um, okay. 1% oppose and 3% um, don't have opinions. Okay, so one of the people that I work with is Dr. George Bonefalk, who is a, who is a retired neurosurgeon, mm -hmm. and he supports Medicare for All. And um, he, you know, he's he would love to come on your show. I'm sure he or Dr. Sachs. Okay. And um, so um, neurosurgeons they can make eight hundred thousand dollars a year. Eight eight. $800,000 a year. I, I heard that. That's a lot of money. <laughs> I'm in the wrong profession. <laughs> doctors, some of these doctors may not get their third jet. <laughs> so they'll get their first two. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. So, so he says, but the normal doctor will make the same amount. So your, um, so your practice, your physicians, um, your, your family physicians, they're going to make about the same by no means as an advocate. Am I advocating cutting doctor's cost? Um, right. I have a friend who is a pulmonary artery specialist. Mm -hmm. He makes ungodly amounts of money, but do you know what he's doing? He's working the ventilators for the COVID patients. Mm -hmm. And when he home, he carries the COVID into his house to his four children and his wife. Oh. So do his, his wages are earned? Absolutely. Yeah. You have to go to school to earn this. So I'm not advocating doctors get any less money. They, doctors only take 10% of what we spend on healthcare. It's the insurance companies that take all of this money. We can save $500 billion dollars and mm. give everybody insurance by getting rid of insurance companies and that that are you know the whole you can go anywhere because there wouldn't be restrictions on where you go right. so right. like sometimes i have to drive all the way to south charlotte when i live on like northwest charlotte mm -hmm. just to get care because that's where my insurance approved right. it yeah um, all of that would be gone that the waiting time where people have to sit on the phone and ask for approval, that would be gone. It's right. up to the doctor's discretion. Does this patient need this procedure? If so, give her the procedure. Right. You know that? Mm. Um, in your case, you know, what I feel in your case is um, you need to see lots of doctors. I do. <laughs> uh, yeah. You need to find somebody who knows what you have because you know something's wrong. Mm -hmm. And every time you change a doctor, they're going to overcharge you. You got to get that new patient fee. You got to mm -hmm. go through. Well, in a, in a single payer system, you can see as many doctors as you want um, to get the diagnosis that you need. Right. So I went through 10 doctors in mm. my and finally got a rheumatologist, mm -hmm. okay? And that too. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. 10 doctors to get there. Yeah. So you keep going in our, in our current healthcare system, you, you have to keep going and you have to keep spending the money to get the answers that you need. Um, in my particular story, I was pretty much, I was really sick. And I got my life back when I got my diagnosis because I knew what I was up against. Yeah, and, and that's, the, that's the thing, Tara. I don't mean to cut you off, but it's like when I go to the doctors, you know, one thing about my, my body is that I get used to, used to the medicines fairly quickly. So I have my family doctor who doesn't want to prescribe me pain medicine because he doesn't want to keep giving me pain medicine. But then... Yeah. He refers me to a pain doctor <laughs> who says, well, what are we treating you for? And I'm telling him, no one can say. They're trying to say it's fibromyalgia, but that's only because they don't really know. Yeah. And so now you're treating me for fibromyalgia. It helps, but it's not taking my pain away. And Tara, when I tell you that 
I cannot think of a day that I have had a pain-free day for the last six years. I couldn't, I can't even pick a day. Um, and I'm still, I still, fibromyalgia, I know that's because they can't figure it out any otherwise. And exactly. I'm on all these different medications, gabapentin, tramadol, flexoril, stuff, you know, that's not good for the kidneys and so forth and so on. But if I don't take it, I can't walk. And then I'm a mom. I can't just lay in the bed all day. Yeah. So with this system, I would hopefully be able to, you know, my mom is trying to tell me I need to call Duke or I need to call, um, yeah, it's Duke. She said, maybe you need to reach out to higher specialists to try to figure out what's going on with you. And, but then that costs money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, days off from work, traveling, it's 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 a, it's a mess. And this is not the way God intended us to live. And I I just know it's just not the way we're supposed to live. Not at all. Well, if it makes you feel better, it took me 12 years to find my diagnosis. I I can't imagine. From the beginning of the symptoms. So you really do have to push through. Um yeah. and, and my current advice is to once you start and max out your deductible mm -hmm. um go to as many doctors as you can once you've maxed it out mm -hmm. so get the bulk of your work done when you know that they can't charge you more right. now, so <laughs> they right. will only book you for a surgery january 1st just to get that deductible <laughs> right so you right. have to be on that but you know, um, definitely your health is worth it. And everybody should have access to affordable health care. $7,000 as, as a deductible is not affordable. Mm -mm. So, um, yeah, I mean, you and I, we can talk offline anytime you need help. And I can also connect you with, you know, once you get plugged into the healthcare justice doctors, mm -hmm. um, you know, they have more resources and there's so many different doctors. I th we have an orthopedic surgeon that's retired. We have a, um, a neurosurgeon. We have at least three. Um, they are uh, family physicians, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe four family physicians. Yes. Um, and so there's a large team. We have a pathologist. Um, yeah. And so um, you and I, we can definitely talk offline, but I definitely want, to, want you to use those positions as a resource for you. Um, yes. Because them, like, even if you tell them your symptoms, mm -hmm. they can guide you to where you need to go. Because right. for me, I was like you, like people thought I had like irritable bowel syndrome. Uh -huh. And I was like, um, okay, I, I do have bowel symptoms, but there's something else going on. Going on. Right. Right. And then, then I got diagnosed with IgG4, but it took them 12 years. Mm. You know? Yeah, so, I, I've gotten to the point, Tara, that I don't, I don't even go to the emergency room anymore because all they're going to do is just dope me up with pain medicine and send me home. And then going to different specialists, I just kind of said, you know what, I'm just going to deal with, deal with the pain. But I really want to look into this because my mom and, and my family, my 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 children are watching me in pain all the time. My husband's having to pick me up out of the bed and walk me to the bathroom or get me out the bath at times. So I, I'm definitely interested in finding out more. And I think that, um, I'm not sure if you know, Ms. Shy Melton, she's been on the Speak Up and Inspire series before and she's have, she has an autoimmune um, disease where she's constantly in the hospital. She's constantly fighting and and really advocating for herself, which is what I've had to do because I didn't know of this resource. So this is really a really good resource and definitely a good movement that I um, would love to get involved yeah. in. Tell me her name again. Shaterik. Yeah. It, yes. Yes. So Shaterika has um, mast cell disorder. Yes. And mast cell disorder is very, like I, they gave me the mast cell test thinking, and they told me you probably are a mast cell patient. Mm -hmm. um, I love Shaterika because um, she suffers with um, with the same similar disease as me. Mm -hmm. Like our joke is, we were in style before they were in style. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, 
but um, for sure. Um, yeah. Shaterika struck like her disease. I'm more functional than Shaterika. Shaterika yeah. fights her life every single day. Yeah. Um, and I've been able to cut my diet down to about 10 foods. So I eat about 10 foods a day and I do fine. I'm mm -hmm. very particular about the environment that I go into, you no know, cleaning supplies. Um, if I smell cleaners, I have enough time to leave and mm -hmm. then I don't have a flare. Um, Shuterica, hers are a lot more severe. Yes. Um, and I absolutely believe her. And I'll tell you, I'm going to bring race into the picture, okay? I'm going to bring race into the picture. As a white person, you can see my face turn red when I'm having an allergic reaction. Mm -hmm. Which, you can't see that. You That's know, true. you rely on her telling you that she's having an allergic reaction. And if you're not a good employee and you don't listen to Sheikh Terika, then you're not doing your job. Right. You know? right. So it's been easier for me to maneuver the healthcare system than her. And I still don't like it. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, it's unfortunately, but that's the way of the world that we're in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to say thank you so much for coming on with us. I feel like we need a part two because <laughs> there's a lot of information that you shared tonight and a lot of new information for me, especially, um, and something that I think would definitely be helpful for me and my family. So I definitely want to um, have some offline conversations with you, but just also to kind of follow up with you because you're doing more in the community than just the healthcare, you're doing a lot in the community. So we're gonna schedule to get you back on. Um, I think it's important for us to stay connected with our community and people that are, want to make a difference. And you are definitely one of those people. Um, so I hope that I will be able to get you on again to talk to us um, on the Speak Up and Inspire series. And I just wanna say thank you uh, for, for sharing personal things about yourself because that can be hard as well. But as advocates, we have to share a little bit of ourselves for us Absolutely. to for us to bring about change. So I want to say thank you for doing that. Well, thank you so much. It's been an honor to be on the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. We will definitely have you back on. Thank you everyone for tuning in. I saw that we had a lot of viewers today, um, as always, and we had some new viewers. Um, I think this might be a friend of yours, um, Tara, Mr. Scott Don. He was asking about the platform and if we were live. So yes, Scott, we are live. We are actually in our living rooms talking to each other right now. Um, every Monday at eight o'clock, I have a different guest on the Speak Up and Inspire show to talk about what they're doing in the community. That is the whole mission and purpose of the Speak Up and Inspire series is to showcase people who are giving back and inspiring others. So thank you everyone and have a good night. Thank you, Tara. Mm -hmm. <laughs>